Thank you very much. Happy to be here. This is a perfect time of year to be having a talk about influenza, so hopefully you'll find it useful. And I have nothing to disclose. So here are the objectives. I want you to be able to identify emerging avian flu strains and their potential to cause widespread disease. We'll summarize the benefits and the challenges related to the new availability of quadrivalent seasonal flu vaccines for this winter. And then I will spend a bit of time talking about new technologies for flu vaccine production and some of the new flu vaccines that we have available that you may already be familiar with. So we have to start with just a basic primer on influenza, in case you don't remember. It's an enveloped RNA virus, and the important thing about it is that it has a genome that's carried in eight linear segments, which will become relevant in just a moment. Flu comes in three flavors. There's influenza A, which infects mammals and birds. Influenza B only infects humans. And then influenza C, we don't spend a lot of time talking about, but is a cause generally of mild upper respiratory illness, so it doesn't give us the kind of morbidity that we see with A and B. Influenza A has two main viral surface proteins that are important in its pathogenesis. Hemagglutinin is the first one, and that um, is a protein that causes the binding of the flu virus to the cell that's being infected. And then there's neuraminidase, which promotes the release of new virions from an infected cell and prevents those new virions from aggregating when they're released. There are 16 subtypes of hemagglutinin, or H, and nine subtypes of neuraminidase, or N, so that's how we get the designations like H1N1. And then we have the important concepts of antigenic drift versus shift. So antigenic drift, as you probably remember, is when you have individual point mutations that occur, usually in the viral surface proteins, that over time slowly allow a strain to sort of escape natural immunity or vaccine-produced immunity. Uh, from one season to the next. Antigenic shift is when you have a more sudden reassortment event that results in the creation of a totally new flu virus subtype, and that's what typically promotes the development of pandemics. So this is just a schematic of how antigenic shift works. So you can see on the top, we have two different flu viruses. There's an H3N2 on the left and an H5N1 on the right. Each of them has their own eight RNA segments. If these two flu viruses infect the same cell at the same time, either in a pig or a human being or whomever, um, those viral gene segments can reassort and you can get a new virus. So at the bottom, you can see we have a virus that got the H5 from the virus on the right at the top and got the N2 from the virus on the left. And now we have an H5N2, which is a new flu subtype. And the reason that this matters is that this is typically what happens when we talk about flu pandemics. So there's three conditions you need for a flu pandemic to occur. The first is that a new flu virus subtype has to emerge. So we just talked about how that happens. The second condition is that the new virus must infect humans and cause serious illness. And these first two things are happening relatively frequently, actually, um, in all of the avian flu strains that we're going to talk about. But it's the third one, which is the requirement for the new virus to spread easily and sustainably sustainably among humans that fortunately doesn't happen as often, but when it does happen, that's when we get the flu pandemics that you guys know about. So when we think about avian flu, it turns out that actually avian flu strains can be isolated from more than 100 different species of wild birds, primarily aquatic birds like gulls and also waterfowl, so ducks and swans and these types of birds. So this is happening all the time in nature. Most of these are what we refer to as low pathogenic avian influenza, or LPAI, which just means that they typically only cause mild disease in the bird. But there are some avian flu strains, particularly those of the H5 and H7 subtypes, that are what we call high pathogenic avian flu, or HPAI. And those are the ones that are often associated with the development of more severe disease, uh, both in birds, obviously, but also potentially in humans. Low pathogenic strains can evolve into high pathogenic strains over time, and both of these types of avian flu can infect humans and cause a spectrum of disease activity. So the designation as low versus high pathogenic is based on what happens to the birds, but doesn't necessarily correlate with what would happen in a human if that strain were transmitted to one of us. So you may remember about a decade ago when we first started hearing about H5N1 in Asia. So this is just a newspaper clipping about one of the first um, kids in Vietnam who was infected with H5N1 and who died. And you might remember that over the next several years, there was a lot of media attention and anxiety about H5N1 and would it develop into a new pandemic. 
And so this is uh, the current status for H5N1. This is a chart from the WHO website. You can see there's sort of a select group of countries where human cases of H5N1 have been reported. And if you look on the bottom right, you see that we've had a total of 641 human cases of H5N1 influenza, and 380 of those people have died, giving it a crude mortality rate of 59%. And this is why it created so much anxiety. Because of the high morbidity mortality, it was thought that if this virus achieved pandemic potential, it would be a total disaster on a global scale. But you can also see from this chart that over the last several years, actually the number of cases of H5N1 per year it hasn't really been that high. It was 31 cases in 2013 and 32 in 2012. So even though this virus has been around for 10 years, we're not seeing tons and tons of human cases. So I just thought I'd give you the current status since this has sort of fallen off the radar a little bit over the last several years and you may not have heard as much about H5N1 recently. There are six countries in which avian H5N1 is considered endemic among poultry, and those countries are Bangladesh, China, Egypt, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. As I mentioned, there really has been no significant change in the epidemiology of human cases over the past decade or so. Most of the patients who have acquired this flu strain have had direct contact with birds, and they tend to present with fever and cough, as you would with any flu strain, although these cases, as you know, can progress to more severe respiratory distress and ARDS. So far, there are no travel restrictions in place related to the presence of H5N1 in any of these countries. It is recommended that um, you avoid visiting poultry farms and bird markets, and that you avoid preparing or eating undercooked poultry. Um, if you had a patient who developed H5N1 influenza, the treatment is oseltamivir, which still seems to work against that particular avian flu strain. And there was an H5N1 vaccine that was developed and has been stockpiled by our government, so that if this uh, avian flu strain does become pandemic, we have a stockpiled supply of vaccine that could be used in that situation. But the vaccine is not made commercially available, so you can't give it to a traveler, for example. It's just available for um, government governmental stockpile purposes. So now I want to move on to a newer avian flu strain that has emerged this year and is getting a bit more attention nowadays, which is H7N9 influenza. So this story started back in February and March of this year when three adults in China initially presented with fever and cough. Two of those three had visited a chicken market in the week before the onset of their symptoms. And eventually these patients were tested and were confirmed to have a new avian flu strain for humans, which was an H7N9 strain. And when they looked at the uh, virus, they basically were all identical in all eight of the gene segments, and they all had an M2 protein mutation which conferred resistance to amantadine. And all three of these patients went on to develop severe respiratory disease. They all were started on oseltamivir eventually as part of their course, but despite that, they got worse and all three of them uh, ended up dying. Some of the interesting clinical features about this particular strain for the first three cases, you can see that all these patients had a high fever in the range of about 40 degrees. They all had leukopenia with white blood cell counts less than 5,000. They also had lymphopenia. Two of them had low platelet counts of less than 100,000. They all had elevated CKs, and their chest x-rays showed bilateral ground glass opacity and consolidation. Now, when they investigated the first group of these cases, uh, this is what they found. So this is sort of an image of China. You can see the eastern part of China where these uh, first cases emerged. And if you look at the top part of this figure, the green dots are the first 12 cases of H7N9 that were identified. The purple dots are poultry markets that were visited by nine out of these 12 cases. And you can see in many instances, there was close proximity between the, the purple dots, the poultry markets, and where the cases live. For the other three cases, one of them had participated in a government campaign to cull poultry. Another one had a um, had raised chickens in a courtyard with their neighbor at home. And then the third one had a husband who had gone to a poultry market, had brought home poultry to raise, and then when the poultry became sick, the case patient gave the poultry antibiotics. So if you're an epidemiologist and you're doing an investigation and you get that story, you're really psyched because that is a great story to establish the link you're trying to make. 
So if you haven't been to China and seen a poultry market, I haven't been either, but these are just images from the internet. This gives you a sort of a flavor of what it's like. So um, these environments have a large number of birds, a lot of chickens, but also other types of birds. And the birds are in very close proximity to human beings. And you can sort of imagine just from these images how easy it would be for avian flu strains to sort of make the leap from birds to humans in this type of environment. So when they went back and looked at the virus to figure out how did it emerge and where did it come from, this is what they found. So um, the hemagglutinin gene seemed to have been derived from domestic ducks from an H7N3 virus. The neuraminidase gene came from an H7N9 virus that was present in wild birds. And then the other six gene segments came from a variety of H9N2 viruses in domestic poultry. So the emergence of this virus required multiple reassortment events, which was either occurring in nature in places where these different types of birds were all present at the same time, or potentially in these live bird and poultry markets like I just showed you. And then once this virus had emerged, it was then able to be transmitted from birds to humans beings. So this is just a study looking at um, 82 confirmed cases a little bit later on into the epidemic. Uh, you can see from this figure that the uh, areas in China during in which this virus had emerged are spreading now. So it's gone beyond that original place of emergence. And there's even one case in Beijing among these first 82. And if you look at these little pie charts on the graph, the red portion of the pie chart represents the proportion of cases who died. And you can see, interestingly, that for many of these locations, actually, it's a relatively small proportion of cases. So unlike H5N1, it didn't seem like the mortality related to this virus was necessarily quite as high from these original reports. But when they went back and looked, about two-thirds of these cases, of these 82, had visited a live poultry market. And about three-quarters of these patients had some sort of exposure to chickens. Then we began to learn a little bit more about H7N9. So this figure shows you two family clusters that were the first evidence that human-to-human -human transmission was occurring. So on the top, we have a family in Shanghai. The index case patient developed disease, was admitted to the hospital, and ultimately died. That patient actually tested negative by PCR, but was a suspected case based on the history. And then two of the family members, who both provided care to the index patient while they were sick, went on to develop flu-like illness, were admitted to a hospital, and both were confirmed to have H7N9 by either serology or um, PCR culture. And then on the bottom, there was another family cluster in a different part of China. Um, the case patient, again, visited a poultry market and then developed influenza-like illness uh, and then uh, was tested for flu. That test was actually negative, but it remained a suspected case. And then there was a family member who was living with that case patient and providing bedside care during the period when they were sick including washing the clothes of the case patient. So this patient had had a lot of diarrhea, and the family member washed their underwear, which was heavily soiled, and then went on to develop influenza and tested positive for H7N9 by PCR. So these were the first two clusters confirming that human-to-human -human transmission was probably occurring with this virus. There was a lot of concern based on some interesting studies that maybe this virus would turn out to be worse than H5N1. And this is a figure showing um, some ex vivo tissue cultures. They have um, bronchus and lung tissues, which they infected and looked at the repl replication of H7N9 in those sites compared to H5N1. I should say that historically, H7N9 avian flu strains have been uh, known to cause conjunctivitis and sometimes upper respiratory infection, but we're less likely to cause lower respiratory tract disease. But in this uh, left side of this figure, you can see the kind of corally and red colored bars are a replication of H7N9 in the bronchus in the lung. And the kind of light green, uh, mint green bars are H5N1. You can see that the H7N9 virus actually seemed to replicate better in the bronchus in the lung than H5N1 did. And if you look on the right, which is um, tissues that were infected with these two virus strains and then 24 hours later were stained, you can see that 
that um, the middle panels, which are the H7N9 virus, there was a relatively heavy staining in the bronchus in the lung for this virus compared to the bottom row, which is H5N1, where there was minimal staining. So it seemed that this virus actually has a tropism for the bronchus in the lung, which made a lot of people worried that maybe we'd be seeing more lower respiratory tract disease and worse infection with H7N9. There was also concern because of the development of antiviral resistance. So this was a study looking at about 14 or so patients who had H7N9, uh, many of whom received oseltamivir therapy. And then they, their virus was recultured uh, after they had started oseltamivir, and they sequenced it to look for evidence of antiviral resistance. And the two patients in the red box, you can see there was an arginine to lysine mutation, which conferred resistance to neuraminidase inhibitors like oseltamivir providing evidence that this H7N9 avian strain is capable of becoming oseltamivir resistant if you give a patient that antiviral medication. So again, that would be very concerning if it were to develop pandemic potential. Despite all of these anxiety-producing pieces of evidence, though, we also began to learn that there were also a lot of mild cases of flu from H7N9. So this is a series of five patients, three of whom were children, who developed uh, influenza-like illness. Two of them were admitted to a hospital and were tested and were positive, but then recovered and were discharged. And three of them actually never even went to the hospital. They were seen in a clinic with mild influenza-like illness and were treated and recovered and did fine. So it became apparent that it's not all severe influenza with this new strain. There's a lot of mild disease going on as well. So as of August 12th, which is the last time that the WHO website was updated about this, this is kind of the picture of H7N9. So you can see that it did spread throughout a portion of eastern China, um, and there are cases as far north as Beijing and one even in Taiwan, but it hasn't really spread anywhere else, and there have been no evidence of cases outside of China so far, which is sort of interesting when you think about the epidemiology of flu and how easy it is for illnesses to get outside of a country in our kind of current global travel environment. And these are the reported cases. So you can see there have been 135 total cases of H7N9 in humans. 44 of those patients have died, giving a crude mortality rate of 33%. So it's still pretty substantial, but it's actually lower than we saw with H5N1. And the other thing you can see from this epidemic curve on the bottom is that um, there was a rapid uptick in number of cases in March and early April, and then it really slowed down. And basically, since the beginning of May, there have only been very intermittent sporadic cases. And it's not exactly clear why this is the pattern and why the cases sort of petered out like that. Part of it is probably the world health response to the um, emergence of the virus, which involved educating people about how to avoid flu and culling poultry in live bird markets in China where there was concern that this virus might be present. But it's not totally clear whether that is enough to explain why the case is basically completely petered out after that short burst of time. Recently, there was some media attention suggesting that maybe there was another case or two in October. So it could be that it actually isn't petering out, and maybe as the seasons go on, we may start to see another surge of H7N9 emerging. So I think it's too early to say about that. So how does this relate to you in New England? <laughs> you, the main thing to know is that you really need to ask your patients about potential risk factors for avian flu. So as we go into flu season and you begin to see patients who have influenza-like illness, which as a reminder, the case definition is fever plus either cough, sore throat, or respiratory distress. So it's important to remember that sore throat is a hallmark symptom of flu. And patients who have fever and sore throat, you should think about influenza. So if you see a patient like that, there are three questions you should ask them. Them. Have you traveled to any of these countries that are known to have avian flu within the last 10 days prior to symptom onset? Have you been exposed to any people who have traveled to those countries within 10 days? And have you had any direct exposure to birds and especially to chickens? 
It only takes about 10 or 15 seconds to go through these three quick questions, but it will be very useful if you identify someone with influenza who has just come back from China and visited a poultry market, because you need to immediately call your public health authorities and tell them about this so that they can help guide you about how to test for these avian flu strains and what to do so that we'll have sort of an early signal as to whether we're seeing cases emerge here in the United States, which we haven't seen yet. So please do ask these questions throughout flu season when you see patients who have flu. Okay, so now I'm going to transition to regular seasonal influenza. And just to remind you about how we're doing in terms of vaccination coverage, these are the data from last year's flu season. So you can see among, as a reminder, it's recommended that all people older than six months of age receive a seasonal flu vaccine every year. Among all those people, last year, 45% of them were vaccinated against flu. We do a little bit better in young infants and young children. So six to 23 months, the coverage rate is about 77%. But you can see as kids get older, it drops with every age group. And by the time you get to those 13 to 17 year old adolescents, only 42% of them have received flu vaccines. So I think we have a lot of room to move. This is better than it's been in prior years, but there's a lot of improvement. And I would strongly urge all of you guys to make sure that you're actively talking about flu vaccine with every patient and family that you see. So now just to mention quadrivalent flu vaccine. So as you probably know from media, um, in prior years when it, we've looked at how effective is flu vaccine against flu infection, um, it's not that great actually. It's only about 56% effective against medically attended acute respiratory illness. Having said that, it's still the best way we have to prevent influenza, and so that's why it's still recommended as a core strategy for influenza prevention. And those data come from years when we were using trivalent vaccines. So trivalent meaning that there are three strains in the vaccine, two strains of influenza A and one strain of B. But you may be aware that since 1985, there have actually been two antigenically distinct lineages of influenza B virus that have circulated every year. One is called the Victoria lineage, and one is the Yamagata lineage. And infection with one of these B strains does not really provide much cross protection against the other strain. And vaccination is the same story. If you get one strain in the vaccine, it doesn't protect that well against the other strain. Now, before we get into the new vaccines, we have to go over some, tech, some terminology. So we used to have this old term, TIV, trivalent uh, inactivated vaccine. And now, starting this year, we have a lot of new influenza vaccine terms that you have to become familiar with. So now we have IIV, which stands for inactivated influenza vaccine. And that comes in two flavors. There's IIV3, which refers to trivalent inactivated vaccines, which are still available and which replace what we used to call as TIV. And we have quadrivalent vaccines, or IIV4. These are inactivated vaccines. We also have a live attenuated influenza vaccine that's quadrivalent. So this replaces the old live attenuated vaccine, which was trivalent. And actually, we don't have any more live trivalent vaccines. All the live vaccine that's being produced and distributed this year is quadrivalent. So that's the only live vaccine that's available. And then we have two new types of flu vaccines that we've never had before. So we have CCIIV3, which is a trivalent cell culture inactivated influenza vaccine. And we have RIV3, which is a trivalent recombinant hemagglutinin influenza vaccine. So I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about these new vaccine technologies since this is a brand new thing on the scene. So you probably know that traditionally the way we produce flu vaccines is that we start with an influenza vaccine seed strain and we put it into chicken eggs and allow it to replicate and grow and then we take those viruses and put them into the vaccines. So this strategy has many disadvantages, including the fact that it requires a supply of 900 million chicken eggs every year just to produce enough flu vaccine for the United States, which I was stunned by when I saw that that was the number. It also requires that the seed virus be able to replicate in the eggs. And actually, it turns out that some seed strains don't replicate that well in chicken eggs. And if that is the case for a given year, it delays vaccine production. We have a relatively slow timeline for flu vaccine production, it takes about six months before we get a vaccine available, which is why we have to predict so far in advance which strains to put in. Because we're using chicken eggs, people who are allergic to eggs may be allergic to the vaccine. And finally, it requires that we have a new vaccine produced every year and everybody has to get a new vaccine every single year. So there, because of all these disadvantages, there's been a lot of interest in new ways to produce flu vaccines, and now we've got a couple of those on the scene. 
So the first one is the cell culture vaccine that I mentioned. So in this technique, you basically take cells in a cell culture rather than using chicken eggs. You put your virus into the cell culture and it propagates in that tube. And then um, you purify it and you sort of split it and take the, the virus strain and put it into the vaccine. So the advantages of this method over our traditional method is that it's not reliant on a supply of chicken eggs. It does still require that the initial seed strain, which is made in eggs, uh, is so there is egg used in the initial strain. And because of that, people who are allergic to eggs will still potentially be allergic to this cell culture vaccine. One other advantage is that um, the cell culture allows more rapid scale up and a higher virus yield because you just get better replication in these cell cultures than you do in the finicky egg system. And then the other advantage is that because you're not using eggs and live um, biologic products, you don't need any preservatives like thimerosal and you don't need any antibiotics in the production of the vaccine. So this adds to the supply of thimerosal free vaccine, which is always helpful for the people who are concerned about thimerosal as part of vaccine safety issues. And then we have the recombinant vaccine, which is a totally different way of producing flu vaccine. So you take a specific antigen, in this case the hemagglutinin from an influenza virus, you put that into a vector which is not pathogenic to humans, and usually what's used is a baculovirus, which is a virus that can infect insect cells. And then you put the vector into a cell culture and you allow the hemagglutinin gene to basically be produced at high levels, and you harvest it and purify it, and you directly inject the recombinant hemagglutinin into your patient's arm rather than putting in a whole influenza virus that's been inactivated. So the advantages of this technology is that, again, it's not relying on the egg supply. And actually, in this case, there's no egg at any step, including for a vaccine seed strain. So people who are allergic to eggs can receive these recombinant vaccines with absolutely no adverse events whatsoever. And this is also an uh, antigen sparing technique. So instead of taking the whole flu virus, which has a lot of different antigens, and injecting it into your patient. Now you're just taking one antigen, the hemagglutinin, which is known to be the one that is important for developing antibodies against flu, and you're just injecting that antigen. So it's a way to spare the number of antigens that are being injected into the patient's body. Okay, so having said all that, here's a table of all the available products that are available now, and it's much more complicated than it used to be. So you can see there's a whole variety of IIV3 trivalent inactivated vaccines made by different companies and indicated for different age groups. Um, all of those are intramuscular except for one intradermal vaccine that is uh, available for adults. We have a high-dose trivalent inactivated vaccine, which is only indicated for people over 65 years of age. We have the recombinant trivalent vaccine, which is indicated for people 18 to 49. We have the quadrivalent vaccines. There's three inactivated ones, which are available for children, some of them for kids over three, and one of them for kids down to as young as six months. And then we have the quadrivalent live attenuated vaccine, which is indicated for patients who are two to 49 years of age and who don't have other underlying medical conditions. So what are the benefits and issues with all these vaccines? Well, if you look at last year's flu data, of 815 flu B viruses that were subtyped and looked at um, last season, two-thirds of them were the Yamagata lineage, which is the one that was in last year's flu vaccine, and one-third of them were the Victoria lineage. So the flu vaccine we had last year was missing coverage of a third of the flu B strains that were circulating. Now that we have these quadrivalent vaccines, there's the potential to cover both of those flu B strains. And so that's the theoretical advantage of quadrivalent vaccination. Whether that's going to have a substantial impact on clinical disease burden, I think, remains unclear. Generally speaking, influenza A tends to produce more severe disease than influenza B, so we don't see as much hospitalization and mortality related to flu B to begin with. So it may not impact hospitalization rates and death rates, but it may impact outpatient clinic visits or healthcare utilization resources. So that could also be very important, and I think people are hopeful that at the end of this season, we will have seen some of those benefits from the new quadrivalent vaccines. 
The quadrivalent vaccine costs about 50% more than the trivalent vaccine, so that's obviously one issue. As I just alluded to, we have a lot of vaccine formulations now, all of which are approved for different age groups. So it's much more on you now to be aware of which vaccine you're using and which ages it's approved for, because they all differ. And as I noted, the two exciting new flu vaccine technologies, the recombinant and the cell culture, haven't been approved yet for children. So those are only indicated at the moment for people 18 and over. And then the other thing that's new is that the recombinant vaccine, if you are going to use it for older adolescents, has a shelf life of only 16 weeks. So unlike previous flu vaccines, you can't just purchase it at the beginning of the season and keep it on the shelf until May because it will expire. So if you're going to be using that vaccine, you have to be aware of when you bought it and what the expiration date is. So it's gotten a bit more complicated, but potentially also more helpful for the patients. So with all of these issues, one thing that would be great would be if we could have just a universal flu vaccine that would get around some of these um, complicating factors. And the idea behind this would be you would take some part of the flu virus that is more conserved. So instead of choosing these hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins, which have undergo antigenic drift and antigenic shift, as we talked about, if you could take a more core part of the flu vaccine, like the M2 protein or a nucleoprotein on the inside or even a conserved epitope of the hemagglutin in stock and use that to create a vaccine, it would be less likely that the flu virus would escape it and you'd have to remake the vaccine every year. Ideally, you could have find a single vaccine that would provide protection against all subtypes of influenza A. And you could avoid this requirement for annual vaccination because the flu vaccine, at a minimum, might last through several flu seasons, or if it was good enough, potentially could be a once-in-a-lifetime flu vaccination that would give you lifelong immunity. And the other benefit would be that we could stockpile such a universal vaccine for pandemics so that when a new avian flu strain emerged, rather than waiting to figure out what it is, get the virus, sequence it, create a vaccine, et cetera, you'd already have a whole stockpile of universal vaccine that you could just immediately begin administering. And you might be able to interrupt some of these pandemics earlier on by making more people immune before the virus has spread as globally as we've sometimes seen in the past. So I think this is sort of the utopia for flu vaccine um, people, and this is really what we're trying to work towards. And actually, I should say that we're, this is probably not that far away. So people have already created a prototype of this type of universal vaccine that's been tested in animals. And it was shown actually in mice, ferrets, and monkeys that this type of universal flu vaccine is immunogenic and produces antibodies. So I would say within the next maybe five to 10 years, it's very possible that we could actually see clinical human trials with this type of vaccine and potentially have something on the horizon that we might all be able to benefit from from. So just to summarize, avian flu does remain a threat. Both H7N9 and H5N1 are still out there and circulating and causing human cases. So you should be aware of them and you should ask your patients about risk factors for those infections. Quadrivalent flu vaccines and new vaccine formulations are now available and you can use them this flu season starting now. But just remember that the cell culture vaccine and the recombinant vaccine are not yet approved for patients under 18 years of age. Overall, vaccination rates still remain too low, so I would ask you all to take it upon yourselves as your mission this year to have all of your patients who are over six months vaccinated against influenza and all their family members as well. And then finally, these new vaccine production technologies, I think, really do hold promise for the future of a universal influenza vaccine, which we are all waiting for very expectantly and which would be extremely helpful. Thanks a lot.